the honorable court had further observed that the protection provided to doctors against routine arrest or filing of an fir by the police was only a stop gap arrangement till the time our parliament made a law on this subject so in this convention we are going to discuss and deliberate whether the reasons for providing this protection are still good or should this protection be done away with or should something else be added perhaps some additional procedural safeguards what legal changes are required which could help everyone the patients the doctors and the society as a whole should the parliament make a new law or not we will attempt to find the solution a solution that will be good for all a solution that will be pragmatic that can be easily implemented a solution that will cause minimum harm we are certainly not here on a fault finding mission but we are here to collaborate to find the best answer in the given circumstances an answer that will remain relevant for the future too friends amongst us today we have distinguished judges who have adorned the highest constitutional courts of this country and judges who have graced the law commission of india their valuable opinions suggestions and their reasonings will help us in our endeavor today we also have among our panelists today the law makers including the chairman of the parliamentary standing committee on health his learned views will help us in understanding the dilemmas of the parliament on this subject moreover he is among the best persons to convey our views before the lawmakers of this country we also have here today eminent lawyers doctors administrators regulators who will also help us in shaping our thoughts and ideas on this important topic last but not the least we are here at the most opportune time this is because the honorable home minister of india shri amit shah ji had recently stated that the criminal laws are under review by the government and certain amendments have been proposed in the criminal procedure code on behalf of my organization institute of medicine and law i assure you that we will soon come out with a white paper drawing insights from today's discussions and will share it with the policy makers and the opinion leaders this convention is not the end but the beginning of a new journey with these few words i would now like to introduce the chairperson of this event professor dr wait prakash mishra dr mishra is a professor of excellence professor of eminence professor emeritus and a distinguished professor he has the dsc honoris causa by seven different universities he is the national head of the academic program and unesco chair in bioethics haifa and member of the international committee for bioethics for asia pacific region he also happens to be the chief advisor to the honorable chancellor and krishna institute of medicine medical sciences karad and the pro chancellor datta mege institute of medical sciences nagpur i now invite him to inaugurate this convention and start with his opening remarks thank you over to you dr ved prakash mishra
Thank you very much, Ravendra. I deem it my pleasure to be participating in this very laudable initiative of relevance, wherein the participation which has been invoked, in my understanding, can be categorized into three distinct preambles. It's a congregation of eminence. It's a congregation of prominence. It's a congregation of relevance. And therefore, we have every reason to believe that we shall be in a position to cone down to a consequence which will be of desirable nature. Very rightly put in, we are sitting at a situation where violence against doctors and therefore remedial measures there too have turned out to be an inevitable necessity. We shall be deliberating on the various aspects of it. But as very rightly pointed out, contemplation of a law which would be of use, which would be of utility, which will be having appropriate teeth, deterrent in nature and character, and therefore it will be in a position to invoke a required impact, turns out to be the necessity. Right from the historical perspective, from Jacob Matthews to permanent Katara to various state enactment laws against violence, is a matter of historicity which is already there on the annals. And in the context of the fact that ultimately there is an inevitable necessity whereby a single little example should be in a position to prove. For the first time, the Indian Epidemic Act came to be amended. And that was through issuance of an ordinance during the context of Corona pandemic plaguing the country. The four important inclusions which were incorporated in the Indian Epidemic Act, absolutely timely, relevant, and they definitely have proved to be of impact. The material question is, is a healthcare worker not entitled to safe environment? Is he not entitled to security and safety is a million dollar question. Is that not a part of the legitimacy? Is it not that a part of within the scope and meaning of the doctrine of legitimacy of expectations? And therefore, if that be the case, it is not that it is a unilateral security or safety that is being expected. It is a safe, secure environment which will entitle him or her to render the best which is mandated in the given situation and circumstances in the larger interest of the welfare and well-being of the patient and the generic population as a whole. Therefore, ladies and gentlemen, there are roles within roles, there, there are situations within situations, and there are ways and means in which there are aspects which need to be dealt in a timely manner. The fact that in general, the, in, the opinion is that there is a need for the amendment of the criminal procedure code and incorporation of the provisions in the criminal laws, which government of India has said through its honorable home minister that the matter is open for review. I think this initiative definitely will pave the way as rightly put in the, in the introductory remarks by, by Dr. Ravindraji, that we would, be, we would be in a position to invoke the required inputs, which will be generated out of this gathering of eminence, consequence and relevance, which definitely, in my humble opinion, will go a long way in impacting the required decision making at the policy level. And let us hope that we will be in a position to generate a new dawn for the generation of a new era entitling healthcare workforce in the country to be entitled to legitimate security, safety and safe environment to generate the best out of them in the larger interest of people and population of this country, thereby really going to actualize the welfare state enshrined in the constitution. With these opening remarks, once again, thanking the organizers and also welcoming all the learned participants participating in this entire two and a half hour discussion. With these opening remarks, I am putting across this for the open discussion amongst all concerned. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Mishra, for those kind words. I now move on to the convener of the event, 
and invite advocate mr mayank shir sagar uh, to initiate the proceedings before that i will try to just briefly introduce uh, advocate mayank uh, advocate mayank uh, shir sagar is an advocate on record supreme court he is representing clients in a wide array of civil criminal and constitutional matters with a strong focus on cases on medical negligence he also happens to be on the board uh, on the editorial board of the medical law cases of, for doctors a journal published by the institute of medicine and law uh, over to you uh, advocate uh, mayank thank you for those kind words ravindra ji uh, no intention to do wrong no sensible professional would intentionally commit an act or an omission which would result in a loss or injury to the patient as the professional reputation of the person is at stake a medical practitioner does not gain anything by acting with the negligence or by omitting to do an act unfavorable results are confused with negligence that is what the present scenario in which we are here to discuss how and what to and to the what extent the protection is required for doctors simply because a patient has not favorably responded to a treatment given by a physician or a surgery has failed the doctor cannot be held liable per se dear participants viewers and esteemed panelists i welcome you all to this convention we have a very distinguished panel of speakers who will be sharing their views on this burning topic and i'm sure that we that we all will get deeper insights and come out with some useful suggestions for the greater good ravindra bangal ji has already set the context as the convener of this national convention and a practicing lawyer let me throw some light on the jacob matthews judgment which is a focal point of today's deliberation the judgment clearly lays down that the purpose law is trying to achieve by punishing a doctor for negligence is and i quote from the judgment to make the life safer and to eliminate the possibility of recurrence of negligence in future on the other hand honorable justice dahoti observes in the judgment that the consequences that flow from a doctor's fear of legal proceedings could be disastrous if i may quote from the judgment a surgeon with shaky hands under fear of legal action cannot perform a successful operation and a quivering physician cannot administer the end dose of medicine to his patient he further observes discretion being better part of valor a medicine a medical professional would feel better advised to leave a terminal patient to his own fate in case of an emergency where the chance of success may be 10% or so rather than taking the risk of making a last ditch efforts towards saving the subject and facing a criminal prosecution if it, if his efforts fail such timidity force upon a doctor would be a, a disservice to the society there are other adverse consequences that flow from the indiscriminate prosecution of doctors it distorts the doctor patient relationship and such patient will not benefit of the such and uh, and such punishment to the doctors will not be in the benefit of the patient in the longer run in fact honorable J justice lahoti goes to the extent of stating that it is also unjustified to impose on those engaged in medical treatment an undue degree of additional stress and anxiety in the conduct of their profession and that this is counterproductive and does no service or good to the society there are number of reasons cited in this judgment giving special protection to doctors some may be more relevant other may be less relevant today but all relevant 100% relevant even today simply prophetic let me quote a few of these reasons as laid down by the honorable supreme court human body and medical science both are too complex to be easily understood dealing with the case of medical negligence needs a deeper understanding of practical side of medicine for a medical accident or failure the responsibility may lie with the medical practitioner and equally it may not the inadequacies of the system the specific circumstances of the case nature of human psychology itself and sheer chance 
may have combined to produce a result in which doctor's contribution is either relatively or completely blameless. The factors of pressing need and limited resources cannot be ruled out from consideration. One may have notions of best or ideal practice which are different from the reality of how medical practice is carried on or how in real life the doctor functions. Cases of doctors, surgeons and physicians being subjected to criminal prosecution are on an increase. The investigating officer and the private complainant cannot be always supposed to have knowledge of medical negligence so as to determine whether the act of the accused medical professional amounts to rash or negligent act within the domain of criminal law. The criminal process, once initiated, subjects the medical professional to serious embarrassment and sometimes to undue harassment. He has to seek bail to escape arrest, which may or may not be granted. At the end, he may be exonerated by acquittal or discharge, but the loss which he has suffered in his reputation cannot be compensated in any by any standards. Many incidents involve a contribution from more than one person, and the tendency is to blame the last identifiable element in the chain of causation, the person holding the smoking gun, the doctor. With these judicious and wise words pronounced 17 years back by the then Chief Justice of India, Justice R. C. Lahoti, I invite the speakers of the convention to share their views and I hereby request the moderator, Dr. Parag Ridhani, to take over the session and sail us through the journey that we have begun today morning. Now, let me give a short introduction of Dr. Ridhani. Dr. Parag Ridhani is a CEO of Vokad Hospital Maharashtra and is an extreme and is an esteemed panelist today, and apart from that, a student of medical law and negligence. Over to you, Dr. Ritan. Thank you very much, uh, Advocate Shrisagar. I really appreciate the opportunity. I'm just going to express a few points of view, which will be in divergence to the law and negligence that we're going to be discussing today. I think there is a there's a huge emotional component behind every child becoming a doctor. Every middle class family aspires that their child either becomes a doctor or a lawyer or a chartered accountant. And when a child finally gets into medi medicine after with all the reservation and all the difficulties that we face post 12 standard, there is an aspiration that the child will become a doctor, will serve society. And when the child finally goes out into society and starts serving society, suddenly one day the parents, the family of the doctor get to know that the child was beaten up or the child committed suicide. Who's like there is there is a level of maturity which is absent in society today, which is unable to fathom that there are things beyond the beyond doctors taking responsibility for everything. And I think there is a Supreme Court, uh, there is a Supreme Court judgment which starts off only with saying that doctors are not gods. And I think that's something that we should be aiming to look at today. The other important thing which I'd like to also look at is uh, in, in the years to come, other things that we need to discuss at this forum would be also how to decriminalize, how to clean up the role of doctors and healthcare in general from this portrait of profit making very devious professionals actually commit themselves to saving lives uh, it's not just the bollywood or the you know the society at large or media there are even doctors who speak about this in a large way i am not saying that we don't have those bad apples but not all apples are bad and I think that we all finally need to look at it from the individual family point of view. When a, a doctor loses his or her life, there is a family that's left behind. There are patients who suffer. And in a country where we are already suffering from an extremely, extremely low percentage of doctor to population ratio, uh, more pronounced in certain areas than the metros and the larger cities, it is very, very important that we seek to resolve these issues so that doctors are not made to suffer. I have personally been at the receiving end of physical and mental harassment in my role as a medical uh, administrator in, in a hospital. And I have personally gone through the stress 
that one goes through. I've had security outside my room for over 20 days under pressure from political elements who sought to criminalize this entire death that happened at a particular time. So I think it's high time that we understand the need for this representation. And I'm extremely, extremely glad that society is now finally waking up to this. With those opening remarks from my side, I'd like to give yield floor to my first panelist. My first panelist is somebody who has spoken out earlier and needs to speak out again, especially at this forum. Ladies and gentlemen, I request Dr. Sunit Upadhyay to please speak now. Dr. Sunit Upadhyay is an addiction psychiatrist, a sexologist, and a neuropsychiatrist. He's also the husband of late Dr. Achna Sharma. Dr. Tripathi, uh, I mean, I'd like all the panelists to kindly yield time so that Dr. Upadhyay is able to speak out and is able to be heard on this forum as well. Over to you, Dr. Upadhyay. Thank you, Dr. Bharat. Am I audible? Yes, Dr. Upadhyay, you're audible, sir. I would like to say that governments are so uh, lazy in implementing actions against their officials. officials. Like in my case, SP has accepted that he gave the order to lodge an FIR because it was government's policy to accept every FIR. He sorted this in his written statement. Despite of that, government has not taken any action against that SP or SHO and DSP. They have deliberately done it just to protect their officers they are working. Government is working for that only. Second thing, using dead body as a bait is a most problematic thing The doctors comes under stress. When there is a dead body outside the hospital, doctor cannot sleep, doctor cannot eat. He is always a threat that people might come to you know, harm me, harm my family. I have seen face on, of my wife and she, she was continuously crying when dead body was outside the hospital. So she could not um, recover of that agony. So hazardous situation is for doctors and it is an irreparable loss of society. All people of village come to me that said she was a great doctor, she saved so many lives. We are at loss because of some goals and it's government's inactivity. That was my perspective. <laughs> The central role is the must. When, when, when some officers will be punished for the action against the doctors or lodging FIR against the doctor that they did it wrong, officer will be punished, then only message will you know flow in the country. The doctor officers can also be punished for this wrongdoing. That's why central law is a very essential thing. Dr. Upadhyay, I'd just like to interject and ask you one more question. Uh, one the, once the law is actually uh, made law, you know, by honorable parliament members, uh, how, how important do you think it is to be able to percolate this knowledge down to the smallest uh, sub-inspector, the smallest uh, village, taluka, district level? Because at the end of the day, what we've seen, we're dealing today with organ transplants, and we see that even in a city like Mumbai, these laws are not very well known and still, you know, patients are harassed with all of this. How important do you think this population is going to be, sir? Yes, informing the officials about it is not enough. We have already informed that SP that in the Jacob Matthew case, you cannot lodge an FIR against us. But even then he ordered for it. It is not a situation that he was not aware of this Jacob Matthew's case. We, doc team of doctors, informed him, but he did not accept it because there is no example that if you make a wrongdoing, you lodge FIR against the doctor, you will you will you will be spared by the government. They are in this impression. So strict actions against those erring officials is essential. Once a police officer is punished for this wrongdoing, he will have to um, a message will be spread all over. Just sharing the information is not enough, I think. Okay. I think that's extremely, extremely uh, moving to to hear it from the uh, from the husband of a doctor who's actually lost her life due to the stresses that we face day in and day out. Uh, I, we have uh, Honorable Justice Asuk Kumar Ganguly 
who uh, needs to exit this conference due to some uh, prior uh, uh, prior commitments dr uh, honorable justice ganguly served as the chairman of the west bengal human rights commission and also as a judge of the supreme court of india who delivered judgments in some extremely high profile cases like the 2g spectrum case uh, honorable justice ganguly your views on this matter please sir you are on mute no am i audible yes yes honorable justice thank, thank uh, good morning to all of you and the distinguished panelists this problem is a complex because we we fail to realize that in some cases death is inevitable despite the best service by the doctors so for whenever there is a death occurring in a family in most of the cases emotions run high and we tend to blame the doctors not in all cases there is violence but the blame is almost laid at the doorstep of the doctor this is very unfortunate because in criminal law negligence is different from negligence in civil law. this has been explained very well in jacob matthews case in civil law negligence means a civil wrong the mere lack of care but in a case of criminal negligence the learned judges in natural case made it clear unless there is a case of extreme act of rash negligence it does not come within the concept of criminal negligence and the learned judge in the judgment has referred to several exceptions which are already there in it in section 88 section 92 section 93 where it is made clear that causing death of a person with the consent of the person but or without the consent of the person but with the intention of causing giving causing benefit to that person giving him some relief there are several illustration given does not amount to the case of murder but 304a which is the provision in the ipc for causing death by negligence is of many cases applied against doctors so there are certain guidelines given in jacob matthews case in the previous speaker says that despite knowledge of jacob matthews case the file is lodged against the doctor now i tell you it is very difficult for the officers to understand the implication in jacob matthews case unless the observation which are made in jacob matthews is precaution of the guidelines which are already there are transformed into the letters of law it is difficult to guide our officers running in charge of criminal administration all over the country it's very difficult. so it is high time for the parliament to come forward and review this this old colonial legislation of i and make it in tune with the present needs of the time as has been said by judge holmes one of the greatest judge the life of law is not logic but experience so over the experience which i have gathered in the last few decades it is high time in my very humble view that the parliament should step in and in the light of directions given in jacob matthews amend the ipc to make it to give some real safeguard against the doctors otherwise there will be is this unfortunate hap- things are happening all over in much to our discomfort much to my dislike but this is happening and in many cases these are accepted in society it's a social malady violence in this doctor is a social malady not only a mere misunderstanding of the legal situation so sure we always blame the doctor for something which is beyond his control even by even by applying the best care and best expertise sometimes the inevitable cannot be avoided but as soon as this happens we go and rush and blame the doctor this is a very unfortunate situation this needs immediate attention of the of the august body of the parliament These are my views, Dinesh. 
Thank you very much, uh, Honorable Justice Ganguly, sir. Uh, I just also wanted to bring one thing to the fore for our lawmakers. As healthcare providers, all of us essentially function on the premise of primum non nocere, that is primarily do no harm. Even engraved very beautifully in our Hippocratic Oath is the fact that we all endeavor to work with medicine in such a way that the patient remains at the focus of safe, relevant care. And I think what's extremely important, as we will now hear from the doctors, uh, panelists, is the fact that today all healthcare, whether it's the medications that we dispense, whether it is the equipment that we use, whether it is the facilities in which we function, all of them are becoming safer and safer and safer. The burden of, of negligence is something which it does happen. We are not saying that doctors are perfect, but at the same time, there has to have to be proper ways of dealing with it. There has to be a channel to work with this. With these words, I'd like to invite um, Honorable Dr. Gurbir Singh. Dr. Gurbir Singh is the Professor Emeritus at Chitkara University. Uh, sir, we've interacted last year also on this uh, platform, and we know that this is a platform that yields to results. Over to you, Dr. Gurbir Singh. Uh, you have about three minutes to present your views on this topic, sir. Thank you very much, Parag, and uh, all the honorable uh, members on the uh, panel. Now, I am always reminded of something. <clears throat> Let your faiths be bigger than fear. But alas, there exists no provisio as yet to help us garner such faiths. Now, there is uh, what has been explained by the various other uh, preceding speakers, so I will not repeat what they have said. But then, very true is when a <clears throat> healthcare provider is battling a baffling patient scenario, and this gets uh, coupled with uncontrolled, irrational fear of the unknown, it definitely destroys peace, calm, and tranquility of the mind. And that is not a very, very, uh, you know, ideal situation for a healthcare provider to be handling a human life. Now, and again, it was mentioned by the good doctor who has suffered a personal loss, we are all blamed of uh, having uh, chinks in our armor as far as our professional knowledge is concerned. And maybe, yes, there are advances which may not have uh, you know, crossed my eye or my mind. But like the, uh, the uh, moderator said, that do no harm. And that is the motto with which we start ourselves from the home when we do that. Now, is the ignorance on the part of the police member or the variation in their application of knowledge to a vulnerable, timid, and often soft soul like a healthcare provider a tenable defense? I don't think so, because whenever there we make a mistake on the road, ignorance is not the def best defense is what we are slapped in the face with. And now what I'm trying to say is that when I go for work as a doctor, I do wield a pen, which is mightier than the, uh, than the sword. Fair enough. But my eyes only see the good for the individual whom I am treating. Now, when I sit in the chair and I was, I was the regional medical director with the Fortis, when you have an eminent professor come hanging his head down and saying, I know I can help this individual, give him a quality of life. God will decide the quantity of life. Now, that is the vexing part when he has to take a decision whether or whether not to treat the individual. And by doing so, either ways, I feel he has failed in his duty as a healthcare provider. Now, Prag, these are all some things which they said. And now, if you see... If, the, if we were to believe there is nothing beyond the corner, and if the lawmakers feel that reality is the thing which is lying beyond the corner, then is it safer to assume danger and expect the worst, or to be assured of a peaceful state of mind while dealing with a human, human being and a fellow being? Thank you very much. Extremely well put uh, and extremely crisp, uh, Dr. Singh. 
I think uh, the point that you've rightly made is that should we actually ever try to treat? Because if we start assuming that every patient is going to sue us and every relative is going to beat us up, I don't think we'll be in a position to render care. So we do continue with the Good Samaritan in us, the educated professional in us who wants to serve society. And I don't think there is any escaping that, sir. Um, I'd like to move on and request Dr. A.V. Jayakrishnan. Dr. Jayakrishnan is a consultant neuro and spine surgeon at the EMS Memorial Hospital in Perintanal Manan. Uh, he is also the secretary of the uh, NPPS at IMA headquarters. Um, Dr. Jayakrishnan, how does IMA and your personal views also see this problem? What do you think we should be recommending to the lawmaker, sir? Over to you, sir. You have three minutes, sir. In the meantime, may I leave with your position? Yes, yes, sir. Uh, honorable uh, legal numeraries and uh, uh, respected uh, faculties, dear friends. It's a very pertinent topic that we are discussing today. Actually, the cr criminal liability in medical practice is a worrying problem for all the uh, section of medical practitioners, and not only medical practitioners, the health workers itself, because even nurses are uh, uh, being uh, dragged to court for criminal negligence. And uh, uh, doctors face a lot of uh, stress due to the uh, potential threat of uh, being dragged to court, arrested, etc. And the incidences are uh, increasing for the past two, uh, two decades. And in each and every case, due to, as discussed by the panelists, due to the uh, political interferences or due to communal issues, etc., uh, unnecessarily uh, criminal cases are being thrust upon. And uh, uh, the only uh, uh, savior for doctors regarding at present is the Supreme Court verdict in the Jacob Matthew case, uh, in which uh, they have suggested some guidelines like uh, uh, for uh, preventing arrest of doctors. The guidelines say that there should be an expert committee uh, uh, by either a, a district uh, expert committee and a state expert committee, etc., but in practice, what we often find is the expert committee is usually incapable of uh, distinguishing between a gross negligence and a, a routine negligence and an institutional negligence and an individual negligence. This is what we usually find. And due to this, unnecessarily cases are being thrust upon the doctors. That is one of the things. Even if sent to such a district committee, which comprises of the district medical officer, some forensic expert, a, a legal person, etc. Usually, whether it's a gross negligence or a, uh, some form of negligence, whether the, what is the institutional component, all the things are not being uh, distinguished. Another uh, area is, other than IPC, Many other special laws like the MPP Act, OXO Act, PCPNDT Act, all these uh, uh, drag out doctors to uh, under criminal cases. Uh, and even they get arrested due to various reasons, uh, even for not filling up a form. So these are uh, uh, some other instances other than IPC in which doctors have criminal liabilities. And another important thing is that uh, the Supreme Court had even suggested the Medical Council to make some guidelines regarding uh, uh, the uh, how the expert committee should function and all. Uh, the ex uh, Medical Council had given some guidelines in 2018, but I uh, think it's not still finalized. And now the expert committee does not have a proper guideline how to distinguish between a criminal negligence, civil negligence, etc., how the negligence can be thrust upon. And another thing is that the latest NMC guidelines, uh, NMC GMC guidelines, guideline four, just states how uh, uh, in penalties the doctor should be assessed. And in it, it's told that uh, always the attributability and severity of the cases should be analyzed and there are some guidelines. That is not regarding criminal negligence, it's a general guideline, but still all these things should be applied in by the expert committees when they come to the uh, assessing a particular case. And uh, uh, another uh, important thing is that 
we should have a special law because uh, there is no mens rea in any cases of uh, similar negligence and this should not be come under a criminal uh, negligence in ipc and uh, even the medical councils are unarmed in cases of negligence ideally uh, uh, even uh, a greater uh, uh, thing to be taken to uh, for against medical practitioners regarding negligence is action by the uh, medical councils because it's an issue with medical negligence and the medical councils have the power uh, uh, or the national medical commission and state medical commission have the power to temporarily or permanently uh, do a penal erasure of the doctors and even they are uh, qualified to judge these cases and the role of medical councils should be increased so uh, on the part on behalf of ima and on my personal behalf i request that there should be some intervention some uh, law by the parliament to exclude medical professionals from the uh, criminal uh, from the criminal responsibility in medical practice i think uh, uh, dr jay krishnan has hit the nail on the head and he has actually articulated it extremely clear this is his personal stand as well as the stand of the indian medical association being a proud member of the indian medical association i would also second that and we'd like to move on to dr krishnendra mukherjee sir dr krishnendra mukherjee is a consultant general and vascular surgeon from kolkata and also an examiner at the royal college of surgeons of edinburgh uh, dr mukherjee your views on this topic where do you stand on this sir uh, good morning everybody respected dignitaries and judges i hope i am audible I, i want to make one very important point that if the situation remains as it is and lawmakers or parliamentarians only make certain uh, modifications to the existing act nothing is going to change on the ground we have studied a series of cases where a grieved family of patients who who have died have actively pursued a criminal case with the local police station in about 8 cases out of 10 there are local local questionable elements nefarious elements of the society who are involved sometimes local political nepotism is involved and you know there there are factors which are not in the control of the of either of the doctors or of the uh, wider society so what we need to do is section 304a ipc and section 337 and 338 of the ipc these will not be applicable to those jobs not only doctors those jobs where death of another person is one of the likely or spontaneous end points we need to understand that morbidity and mortality are spontaneous end points of the medical profession it is the same with soldiers it is the same with security forces in a conflict zone so what has to be done at a lawmakers level is that a certain list of jobs occupations or professions will have to be protected from 304a 337 and 338 however that does not mean that criminal liability will be completely you know i mean these occupations will be completely uh, safe from criminal liability no national medical council has now replaced the national, national medical commission has now replaced the medical council of india their draft regulations were in the public domain the state medical councils and national medical commission if they investigate a case they themselves will be able to suggest in which particular case a criminal liability might be present and further investigations may be done my humble submission is that certain jobs certain occupations certain professions not only medical profession they have to be shielded from 304a ipc because causing death of another person is a very possible and likely outcome of the very nature of that profession or the occupation as i give examples like a soldier or a security force 
any other modification of cosmetic change will not work because at the ground level doctors are harassed because of political nepotism and because of nefarious elements in the society thank you very much uh, thank you very much dr mukherjee and uh, i think it's extremely extremely relevant to understand what you said uh, that death is the potential outcome of any activity that we undertake while we do take concerns for death on table for high risk uh, complex cases for death due to anesthesia in really complex cases it's extremely relevant for the law makers to understand that and i think i will echo uh, the sentiments of honorable prime minister who keeps talking about one nation one uniform i think though health is a state subject we must ensure that the law once it is made is actually percolated throughout the width and uh, length of the country so that our doctors are actually safeguarded not just doctors as uh, dr jay krishnan said but also our nurses and other technical staff uh, as we move forward i'd like to quickly jump on to a video message from dr arul raj who is the past president of ima and api he is unable to join us as he is attending the commonwealth medical association conference at kuala lumpur but he has graciously sent us a message uh, may i request uh, the tech desk to kindly play the video message of dr arul raj uh, mr agasti and important thing is on the prosecution side on the prosecution side there are two issues one is an fir filing another is an arrest of doctor for fir supreme court of india has given clear guidelines there should be a prima facie and there should be an expert opinion and there should be a superior officer and then by volumes test it should be done and that has to be applied and secondly when there is a i mean arrest of the doctors maximum it should be avoided unless there is a criminal i mean issue i mean cannot be and supreme court has given a direction to the government of india as well as government of states in consultation with the medical council to prepare the guidelines and put it across but it has not been done now these guidelines have to be made i mean incorporated into the ic ipc thank you thank you very much uh thank you very much uh, dr arul raj and thank you techdesk for helping us with that i think extremely extremely clear opinion on where we need to be as also the relevance of volumes law uh i'd like to now invite dr atul shah who is a practicing doctor and also the former president of the association of plastic surgeons of india uh dr atul is an old friend atul uh, over to you you have 3 minutes to present your views please thank you parag good morning to all in the uh, recent time we have been seeing lot of news items which may or may not relate to the problem at question for today's deliberations but you would realize that number of post graduation seats are going vacant in the medical field you would have read about several instances of more and more assaults on doctors and healthcare staff happening you would have learned that uh, number of negligence cases not only in consumer commissions but also through police are increasing and on top of all as it happened in rajasthan the insensitivity of administration and insensitivity of police has come to the surface recently we changed from the indian medical council act to national medical commission act and now nmc is armed to have several rules recently we got new rules framed which are being asked for public opinion is about the qualification of medical teachers in very recent past they came out with even rules concerning the hair transplant so it's very very important now that once and for all either through ipc or through nmc a stricter language of the rule must come on platform which concerns these three things which go hand in hand one is about negligence be it civil all criminal second is assault on doctors and third very important i feel is about capping on the amount of compensation because problems occur as patients and relatives realize that they can walk into a consumer commission or into police station and ask for hefty commission and also at the same time see to it that a treating doctor or a treating team is taken to task 
So it's not just a solitary question of negligence and the arrest of doctor, but two other things come hand in hand. One is assault and second is the amount of compensations that are being awarded. Thank you, Parag. Uh, thank you, Dr. Atul. I just uh, quickly want to move over to somebody who I've been itching to ask a question myself. Uh, I'd like to ask Dr. Mukesh Yadav, who is the Principal and Dean of Rani Durgavati Medical College uh, at Banda in Uttar Pradesh. Uh, sir, your views on this topic and my follow-up question, uh, your views on incorporating an element of applicable laws and liabilities at the medical college, uh, second, third year kind of level, uh, also healthcare quality, actually. Your views on that once you've presented your views. Dr. Yadav, over to you, sir. Thank you, Dr. Parag, for giving me opportunity. And I congratulate the whole team of IML for taking this initiative on a very important pertinent issue, not only for the doctor community, but the whole mankind, especially in India. I would like to share one uh, few slides just to highlight the magnitude of the problem which I collected through the National Crime Record Bureau that will help in Slides are visible? Yes, sir. So, the, the theme uh, which we put regarding criminal prosecution of doctor for medical negligence, statutory changes needed in IPC. I extend it to not only IPC, but the need, changes are needed in the CRPC as well as in the Indian Evidence Act and guidelines which are already laying after this uh, Jacob Methy judgment and Lalita Kumari judgment. Enforcement is very important, not only the law, changing law and if not able to uh, enforce in timely manner, there is no deterrence. The purpose of law is deterrence in the mind of either public or in the doctor community. So what I collected from this, this National Crime Record Bureau is started publishing uh, data on the criminal medical negligence deaths under Section 304A since 2017. And I have data till 2021. So till uh, these uh, five years, total 888 cases have been uh, reported. Average is 178 per year, maximum in 217. And this was pre-COVID in 2018. Minimum 129 in 2020 due to COVID time where hospitals are closed, everything was stand still. And there are similar medical negligence has been reported and number of regions further research is needed for that. Now come to the this uh, top five states which reported highest number of deaths due to criminal medical negligence. And as usual, UP is the highest accounting for more than 14% of total cases followed by Jharkhand 104. Rajasthan 94, Telangana 83, Haryana 68, small state, number are very high. So these are the eye-opener figure. Even in metro cities, in five years, 77 cases have been reported. These are those cases where FIR have been lost. And this is the average and maximum and minimum cases. These are the five metro cities which reported highest number of cases. And Delhi reported highest 11 cases out of 13 in five years. Obviously, region is awareness among the public and that uh, then states machinery and uh, judiciary more sensitive in these places. Another important fact figure regarding age and gender of those who have been arrested. Out of these 662 cases arrested in five years, in spite of Jacob Matthew guidelines, I have no data whether that the procedure protocol followed or not. But as per the age group, between 18 to 30 year, 129 cases, more than 19% cases are arrested. 31 to 45, 404 doctors, that means more than 61% arrested in five years. Between 46 to 60 year, 19.3% arrested. Above 61 year, doctors which above 60 year, less than 1% arrested. But there is no age which is immune from this criminal uh, footfall. 
then this 31 to 60 year which is the most productive age for doctor to serve the society more than 80% cases arrested as per the ncrb data this is important and this shows ki the, the following follow up of those sop or guidelines of uh, jacob matthew or lalita kumari are not followed and again fault is also with the medical community when you go to the gender divide more than 90% out of these 62 were male doctor and less than 10% were the female doctor who have been arrested by the police uh, this is the figure of uh, uh, after that fir the disposal of these cases are at two levels at the police level and another at the court level after trial so this is the figure and what is important what is the charge sheet rate in these cases in 2017 64.8 then 62 average is about 54 more than 54% charge cheating rate that means rest cases either discharge or abated or whatever the reason so what i want to highlight what is the fun in making that fir and harassing doctor if you are not able to come to the that conviction stage so at the disposal level in 2017 out of 39 cases disposed only 5 were convicted similarly in 2018 8 and percentage figure is also mentioned so the maximum conviction is 20% in 2019 minimum was 8.3% in 2020 when you take average it is hardly less than uh, 15% so out of those 164 cases which are disposed by the court only 15 percent convicted that means rest 85 percent they have been acquitted and uh, then you can imagine we can imagine the that the torture mental torture suffered by the doctor this police trial or even the court trial so that is why these figures are important i have taken also this journal uh, distribution of these medical negligence cases in this journal distribution i took as per the the human protection act schedule 2019 they put certain state in particular zone so eastern zone region reported highest 234 cases in 5 year followed by western region northern region 219 then southern region 177 north east state 38 so total 888 cases so this is how this, this uh, prevalence or incidence of criminal negligence is in the india so now my uh, point is whether there is need for change or not the on behalf of myself or my experience in tertiary care hospital as well as as a president of indian academy of forensic medicine we are taking this issue further uh, there is need for change not only in the ipc there is a need to maybe insertion of new section in the form of 304 c Uh, a b then c which read down whatever is jetta jacob matthew guidelines or lalita kumari guidelines then need for change in crpc 154 which mentioned mandatory fir in cognizable case reported to the police and arrest without warrant without that change again uh, the deterrence on these police or executing uh, persons cannot be held or justice cannot be done to the doctor next is indian evidence expert who is expert not defined nowhere it is defined and that is why especially uh, district level poor rural area where no experts are available uh, this uh, uh, justice regarding whether it is a gross case or it is a simple negligence case cannot be decided here role of iml and ifm and ima and other professional body is very important we should come together and fight against this because when you go to the which in your opening remark that a parag uh, in contest to the jacob matthew guidelines it is disservice to the society if you keep uh, say for example out of this 888 that means 100 मेडिकल एडमिशन कैपेसिटी के एट मेडिकल कॉलेज आप क्लोज करने जा रहे हैं यू आर डिनाइंग द पब्लिक ऑफ दो डॉक्टर सर्विसेज टू दो पब्लिक टू होम नाइनटी नाइन परसेंट वी आर सेविंग लाइफ वन और टू केसेस वेयर 
natural consequence is the death as in case of dr archana sharma we are facing this tragic end of our uh, esteemed colleague and i can share empathy of dr upadhyay we have also constituted one another society at india level medical legal society of india mostly doctor with legal background and we are trying to be intervening with the pil filed in the supreme court by dr sunil upadhyay so i request all the esteemed uh, judges and the panelists and iml especially to please uh, go forward on this issue not only just limit to the presenting white paper but to some logical end and i am ready with ifm to support this wholeheartedly thank you thank you thank you dr yadav dr yadav can you just stop the share screen please yeah okay fine um uh, i think that was very very informative and thank you very much uh, for taking this uh, taking the time to research it i'm just going to uh, uh, give some time to our other doctors and before we go ahead i'd like to uh, request tech desk to play dr shikant shetty's uh, video message dr shetty is a practicing doctor and the editor of the medical legal journal medical law cases for doctors i request you to kindly play his message what is the greatest fear of the medical profession today it is the law what should a doctor do should he continue to do what he has been trained for or he keeps learning the new intricacies of law as an editor of mlcd i see so many frivolous cases being filed against doctors if a doctor is neglect he should be punished but the frivolous cases are going to take time away from a doctor's professional life where patient care is going to suffer one of the speakers today has made a very good suggestion dr t n ravi shankar has suggested medical tribunals for doctors i think that should be looked into by the group today hoping that the peers the stakeholders who are involved in this discussion today can give new light for the policy makers to decide thank you Thank you very much. Uh, I'm now going to request Dr. Neeraj Nagpal. Dr. Nagpal is a practicing doctor, also the convener of the Medical Legal uh, Action Group. Dr. Nagpal, your views uh, in a crisp form, at least. Over to you, Dr. Nagpal, sir. Is Dr. Nagpal present, uh, Ravindra? Uh, Parag, I don't think he has yet joined in. Okay. Uh, I will move quickly to my close friend, Dr. Suganti Ayer. Uh, Dr. Suganti Ayer is uh, is the deputy director at the PD Hinduja National Hospital and Medical Research Center. Um, also works actively with healthcare quality with the National Accreditation Board for Hospitals and Healthcare Providers. A strong proponent of premium non nocere. Uh, Suganti, your views, please, madam. Uh, Dr. Suganti, yes. your views, please. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, very good morning and congratulations to IML. for holding this program um the way i would look at it is that the doctors are bound with the judgmental laws and which clearly says that saving the life of a human being is of paramount importance this also is said in the code of medical ethics and the doctors also are bound by the hippocratic oath therefore when they have undertaken to treat a patient because it is an emergency and as a life saving emergency the patient has been admitted under them or even if they have chosen to electively treat a patient and later on becomes a life threatening emergency during the course of management very often it is seen that the doctors are struck between the devil and the deep sea because the course of the patient management the it is not like a computer where you give a medication and the response has to be there the human being and the human body is a complex mechanism and the response may be there what may be thought of or not and therefore very often the doctors would like to give an extra dose of medicine or add another medicine or give for an indication which is not really um, standardized going out of it or they would like to do a surgery with an extra stroke of the scalpel and this is primarily the intention is to save the life of the human being also considering the fact that there has to be medical research there has to be medical advances that is how do we have today separation of siamese twins how do we have today the heart transplant so many new medical inventions medical research and how will pro the progress of medical be there 
therefore for the progress of medicine the doctors have to take this extra struggle or the extra risk for giving medication or well surgery at that time if they practice with a halter on the neck as is told in the jacob matthews case then it is much disservice not only in the course of management of the patient to save the patient life and also a disservice to further inventions and further medical research clinical trials and progress of medicine so therefore the any in action or damage that is resulting should be treated as a mere inadvertence or a civil or oh, that is a way it should be and not just because he is holding the smoking gun and he is in the field should be treated as a gross or a reckless negligence the other thing which i would see which i have been hearing constantly yes there would be change in the guidelines and one would see the uh, severity and also the standards by which one would say this is a gross negligence or this is a simple negligence or a civil negligence well said the guidelines would be framed even jacob matthews judgment has come out in 2005 as dr parag rindani earlier mentioned about the transplant act that has come in 1994 and again tota act with the tissues act has been in 2014 which clearly says that the police have to give an noc for retrieval of human organs if it is a medical legal case let me tell you that practically the doctors hospitals etc we are at the mercy of the local police station where the acp is the topmost and in the middle of the night and at all hours who is going to be our judge the person in the police station so we are at that mercy so what i'm trying to say is that the training of these police people and the changing police force very often it is seen that the local police station is not really thorough about jacob matthews etc though it is well said they are not very thorough in about the retrieval of organs of what i meant to say the act etc and being the senior most doctors are at their mercy so this other thing is besides changing the law besides giving guidelines for severity and classification of civil criminal negligence training of the police force and that too of the foot soldier literally because we all are going to deal with foot soldiers and the ongoing training because of the turnover and the transfer of the police station this becomes an important criteria thank you so much for the opportunity thank you very much dr suganti as always crisp um, i think uh, we among on the doctors uh, if i were to classify this as a t20 amongst the doctors team i think we've we've had uh, sachin tendulkar throughout and uh, we have no less uh, sachin tendulkar to end this batting Uh, uh for the doctor's points of view to be put forth in a clear and lucid manner i have dr t n ravi shankar uh, dr ravi shankar is a faculty in medical laws at the anna institute of medicine chennai and also at the shri ramchandra medical college and research institute chennai he is a founder member of the professional protection scheme of the indian medical association of the tamil nadu state uh, dr ravi shankar it's always a privilege to hear from you your views in the next 3 to 4 minutes please so over to you am i audible Yes, Doctor Ravi Shankar sir. Thank you, thank you. It is always difficult to follow Sachin Tendulkar's batting. We have said already seven times, Madam. So I think I have to be very crisp. I think empty number of landmark judgments in this country has been pronounced, but still that has not been followed up properly either by the government or by the medical association, which has resulted in present days debate, discussions, pathetic situation of losing a doctor because of a criminal law. this profession has only three outcomes either the patient lives the life or has a mortality morbidity or a morbidity and finally death so when when there is a morbidity the patient goes to the court try to get money out of it trying to prove a civil negligence or if there is going to be a death it is going to create a need to reaction by the public trying to assault the hospital and take the doctor to a ride and that is where the assault has come and today we are, we are seeing the same scenario ipc have a lot of sections whenever you go to the government they always say there are a lot of sections where by which you can take the task take the task all the people but then there is an excellent uh, ipc section 80 accident in doing a lawful act law gives me the right to practice a profession but where is the law coming to defend me and section ipc 80 is already that 304 304a was all enacted not in the medical profession when it was enacted decades ago it was primarily for the road traffic accidents which has been imposed on the medical community when the medical community was in slumber 
when FIRs has been filed against some random random in the country, and the medical community come into the action at that time, things would have changed a lot. And the excellent statistics given by Dr. Mukul has given some more thoughts for us that the socio-economic, cultural status of the society also will have to be looked into it. And you want to take a different medical community, both by the civil as well as the criminal law. See, all we need, I, I thank Dr. Sri Shetty for recollecting my medical tribunal, which I have done it for the Indian Medical Association almost 12 years ago. And it has gone to the dustbin, but still, uh, people, I still always enforce that medical tribunal is one which can help the medical community in one way or another. There are two, two things which are harassing the medical community. The Consumer Protection Act, where Dr. J. Krishan already has said that he, the uh, administrator should say the medical community is out of the Consumer Protection Act. It cannot happen in a, country, in a democratic country. And that should be a ways and means where it is much more easily approachable both for the medical community and for the society also. That is why I envisage a medical tribunal where things have to go fast. When you have a tribunal for the administrator, when you have a tribunal for the for any more of the labor and all these things, and you want the things to expedite, there are law in the country which takes nearly two decades for a consumer case to be completed. I think that is going to give a sword hanging on the head of a medical professional. We need a medical tribunal which gives shorter time, easier way, both for the doctor as well as the public to approach, get things done. And we have only 10% or 7% of cases in the country against a doctor. We can have a medical tribunal running around the entire country trying to settle the issues at the earliest so that both the doctor as well as the patients are being uh, taken to the right perspective. And then hospital should be, when you have a defense area protected, when you have section 144, which prevents more than eight people assembling at a point, I think hospital should also be labeled as a protected area, given the security, given the safety for the medical professionals and the elite people to function properly, all the ease, that is what why you need a set changes in the IPC sector that hospitals should be made a protected area and people who, who indulge in violence either verbally or physically or in any other way should be taken to task and this law should be educated. I think it is our responsibility to educate the public at least take a year forward try to educate the public that if you damage a hospital if you involve doing anything against the hospital hospital you will be taken to the law law under our medical establishment protection bill in the country, we want a central act so that it is been much more strict and stringent. If these are not being provided, I think slowly the medical community will get vanished. You have the family practice that are vanishing in the country, becoming a specialist country, and then slowly the doctor community also will slowly get vanished in the society if the medical community and hospitals are not protected in the right way to practice the profession with all ease and liberty and to the best of the patients in this country. Thank you for the opportunity. I am in. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Ravi Shankar. I think you've made an extremely clear point and I will just refer to yesterday's news article where the Honorable Union Minister for Health has removed protection from the Lady Hardinge Medical College and we have the resident doctors up in arms. Obviously, there is a fear because of past incidents. All of us carry our baggage of past incidents, our experiences, and that's what's leading us to ensure that this doesn't happen again ever. Now, we'd move over to the patients group. You see, patients are inevitably the focus of our entire effort you know, we, we work every day and we don't sleep at night because we're thinking about our patients. So we'd like to talk to two representatives of patient groups to understand the patient's point of view. I'd like to start with Dr. Ratna Devi, who is the CEO of Dakshayani and Amravati Health and Education. Um, she's uh, also the past chair of the Inter uh, International Alliance of Patient Organization, the IAPO. Uh, over to Dr. Ratna Devi. Do we have Dr. Ratna Devi? Uh, no. She's okay. here. Maybe she, she may be just uh, out for something. Okay. So with my constitutional right of moderator allowing to move on to the other esteemed uh, representative mm -hmm. and a very old friend, Dr. Sanjay Nagral. Dr. Nagral is a senior consultant and director with Jaslok Hospital and publisher of the Indian Journal of Medical Ethics. Dr. S uh, Dr. Nagral, over to you for your views on this topic, sir. Thank you, Parag. Can you hear me? Yes, we are. You're audible, Dr. Nagral, sir. 
By the way, you do you realize you just promoted me to director of this local hospital? I'm not. Uh, th- that's just, the quote that's I'm given just to the me. Just heading one department there, so no, no, no issues. Uh, yeah. So look, uh, first of all, let me start by uh, saying that uh, it's interesting that you have slotted me as uh, a patient representative, and uh, uh, I, I I know where it comes from, uh, and of course, uh, I kind of. Uh, take that responsibility, but you know, as a, as a doctor. So I first want to remind uh, whoever is listening to this that I very much belong to uh, uh, the the beast of uh, the belly of the beast of Indian healthcare, which you know. So I I practice surgery every day, <clears throat> but of course uh, uh, I would also accept that with my interaction over the years and my engagement with uh, what may be generally termed the bioethics movement or the health rights movement in india uh, which is of course very different from medico legal so the term medico legal is very narrow ethics is a much more broader term i have had an opportunity to hear the other side i have had an opportunity to uh, kind of understand the concerns of uh, patients their families may i just also remind everybody on this panel that these distinctions of doctors and patients and i think susan sontag put it very well when she said that we are all born with two citizenships the well and the sick and that at some stage in our lives we'll all be patients uh i just want to start by therefore saying that uh, of course it is excessive wrong and counterproductive to use a tool casually use a tool like arrest for a perceived act of medical negligence and it can only increase the mistrust between professionals the state and our citizens which is not good for everyone including uh, patients and including for the practice of healthcare but may i also suggest in in the limited time that i have that to understand this phenomenon better we may want to consider the following number one arrest as a means to respond to prim- presumed or perceived negligence is actually reflective of the cavalier attitude of our law enforcement authorities and in fact most of us are shielded by this behavior in our day to day lives we are the elite of this society and we get surprised when this happens to us but ordinary people in this country face this all the time that based on flimsy grounds people are arrested number 2 and i say this with a some sense of trepidation but responsibility that actually the the uh, uh, the the way law enforcement agencies behave may be a reflection of a certain uh, lack of trust uh, a certain even anger if you would like to put it that way of the image of the medical profession current, currently being as um, as very corrupt and also often uh, willfully negligent and there is a difference between negligence and willful negligence so therefore i suggest that for a discourse like this whilst we today want to focus on the issue of arrest and negligence and and of course that is a very important issue but we may also want therefore in any such discourse to touch upon the elephants in the room at least acknowledge them which is the lack of universal health care in this country the costs of care the perverse incentives that are offered by a privately dominated system the relative inactivity and lack of credibility of our professional and regulatory organizations and i do not want to go into the history of the medical council of india but it is there for all everyone who, who, to to see incidentally i just had a opportunity to participate in the uh, a committee of the national medical uh, commission which is looking at uh, 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 how to uh, coming out with the new ethics guideline and i participated in the committee which is looking at what should be the penalties and it was a quite an interesting experience and quite a enlightened experience uh, finally i want to say that i do not think with my experience of about 30 years that a large majority of our patients uh perceive negligence and error error every time there is a complication or every time they die uh, what they often want is an explanation empathy transparency and may be in certain situations a concession or a compensation and i think we we may be making the mistake of uh, remembering those few incidents where we have had have been at the receiving end when actually thousands of our other patients uh, in my view uh, are actually very tolerant to the inadequacies of the system uh, 
uh, we are doctors and we have our limitations but our system is inadequate and they actually the average citizen in this country has to face the inadequate requests of the system do not forget covid and the lack of lack of oxygen i also say this para because i do not want anybody uh, listening to us today a young person especially to think that the medical profession in this country is uh, is sort of something they do not want to pursue i would suggest that practicing medicine in india still is an extremely satisfying experience in a large majority of situation finally parag and this is something you will identify with that very often people are agree because the normal mechanisms of complaining uh, whether it is hospitals whether it is the local uh, medical councils or other regulatory bodies do not attend to complaints either Uh, immediately or with transparency and this is what sometimes may push them to take it further to courts and there are umpteen examples of this so in in summary i want this panel and the today's meeting to also uh, finally as a concrete suggestion to my legal colleague suggest that we need sharper definitions of what is poor outcome in medicine what is error and what is negligence and what is criminal negligence whilst accepting that there is indeed a small percentage uh, which constitutes criminal negligence and if we are in denial of that we will not move forward number 2 we need to distinguish between structural and personal negligence structural negligence of our healthcare system which is inadequate versus negligence of the doctor we need to have a process for in- investigation of perceived negligence which is transparent and which is not riveted by conflict of interest which means five doctors don't sit together and decide about a six doctor but that it is that it has diverse representation and finally uh, before i finish i think we need slowly to move to the idea of compensation as opposed to negligence because globally a person who has had a complication uh, has and, and ends up spending a huge amount of either money or time or disability is compensated and i think we need to seriously look at uh, compensation as an option uh, uh, in our situation thank you for your attention thank you dr nagral and i'd probably like to add uh, since uh, we don't have uh, access to dr ratna devi right now i'd probably like to add a couple of points which should be taken up as the responsibility of healthcare providers in toto and doctors in particular i think there is an inherent responsibility of hospitals doctors to be transparent to their patients this is part of the hippocratic oath this is part of the entire ethos of healthcare and i think this is also a risk mitigation uh defusing kind of a uh, strategy which most doctors and hospitals do get into there are uh, hospitals today which train their doctors in crucial communication how to break bad news how to do it um, uh, sort of with a lot of empathy so while we move towards the legal um uh, sort of safeguard so that doctors don't get punished i think it is equally important that doctors and hospitals own up to explaining things the way they stand and do counseling in a timely and extremely extremely honest and transparent manner to that and dr nagral sir i would agree with you and i think that's something which we should also be putting in somewhere as part of this white paper that we're moving towards um i'd like to move on now to the next team in this t20 match that we're looking at and uh, i also recognize that dr uture has a time limit that we need to get to so but before that uh, i'd like to speak to my lawyer colleagues extremely senior extremely proficient i'd like to start with my very old friend whom i've been interacting with over the last 10 years advocate mahendra kumar bajpayee dr advocate bajpayee is a practicing advocate at the supreme court and the honorable director of institute of medicine and law um probably one of the few people whom i know who understands the nuances of medicine as well as the fine nature of law with exceedingly equal sort of uh, diligence over to advocate bajpayee your point of view from a legal standpoint sir uh thank you uh, parag uh friends uh, today i will try to raise four questions and uh, try to answer them question 1 why should there be a special protection to any particular person or a group of person question 2 why as a category doctors need to be protected question 3 is the protection given to doctors by jacob matthews enough and question 
is there anything else that needs to be done the first question why should there be a special protection to any particular person or group and i i'll be answering all these questions as a lawyer the answer is simple if there are justifiable reasons then the state is bound to discriminate positively under article 14 of the indian constitution to give special incentives concessions protections to a particular person or a identified group it is the state's responsibility to do so law not only provides special protection only to weak and vulnerable children old ladies backward regions and so on there are so many privileges and protections that law gives to them but at times law also provides protection to important and powerful ones judges are protected parliamentarians are protected media is protected a week back a member of parliament mr subramanian swami he went to the supreme court my protection is not there it is the public policy the greater good the probable disastrous consequences to the society which are justifiable reasons for providing protection we come to the second question why as a category doctors need to be given a special protection the reasons given by justice lahoti in jacob matthews case and uh, my very good friend mayank chheer sagar ji just now uh, reiterated a few of them were good yesterday are good today and will remain good tomorrow also these reasons are universal they are relevant in india and for that matter in any other country where medicine is practiced scientifically and is evidence based let me add another reason a pragmatic one india specific many panelists have already put light on that doctor patient ratio in our country is dismal why should an academically brilliant student opt for medicine as a career this is actually happening and the worst is yet to come to mat to make matters worse will the threat of prosecution work as a reason for doctors to practice abroad go away from india where life is a bit easy these aspects require serious contemplation there is a counter argument to why doctors should be protected and the counter argument is hey look there are doctors out there who are playing with the lives of patients they are negligent that protection must be removed but then there are black sheep everywhere even amongst the ones who have special protections journalists parliamentarians judges media people everyone so should their protection be removed the loss that would be caused to society by removing these special protections will simply be unbearable lastly friends doctors were always treated specially by law in india jacob matthews protection is simply unique unparalleled salutary indian penal code was enacted in 1897 justice ganguly spoke about section 88 92 93 specific illustrations are appended to the provisions where doctors medical practice they have been defined and described privy council way back in 1943 it was the highest court in india before independence in one case john oni akerle versus the king it has observed and i am quoting the relevant excerpts 
quote the most favorable view of the ac- conduct of an accused medical man has to be taken for it would be most fatal to the efficiency of the medical profession if no one could administer medicine without a halter round his neck in 1943 these were the observations of the highest court in india so the second answer is very clear doctors were always treated specially since time immemorial and across jurisdiction the third question is the protection given to doctors by jacob matthews judgment enough answer is also very simple more needs to be done because in the last 17 years we have seen certain loopholes last one coming 6 months back from rajasthan jacob matthews judgment to a very large extent has proved to be very ineffective let us not forget that in police complaints responsibility was cast on the policeman by justice lahoti to get an opinion from a doctor a doctor in government service a doctor of the same specialty as the doctor accused of negligence a doctor who knows what is bolam's law a doctor who knows what is negligence in the eyes of law jacob matthews intended to plug the spaces for any mischief unfortunately in some cases across the country the investigating officers the policemen are adding other sections of ipc along with section 304a only to bypass the legal hurdles posed by this judgment the rajasthan episode is simply unexplainable so something further needs to be done what needs to be done happens to be the fourth question two suggestions first although jacob matthew advises the government to come up with statutory instruments on this aspect i would suggest that an amendment to the ipc or the crpc would be the best way second some sort of a certification from the superintendent of police from the deputy commissioner of police and ips officer must be taken by the investigating officer dr sunit upadhyay just now shared with us that they had approached the sp and the sp said yes i know that let it come on paper the investigating officer must be bound to take permission official permission from an ips officer before filing of fir against a doctor for criminal medical negligence lalita devi also runs on very similar lines something more than lalita devi and this procedural safeguard will ensure that doctors are protected from false and frivolous prosecutions in fact in the recent sedition case a similar procedural safeguard was suggested across the bar in the supreme court friends uh, that is all what i have to say thank you thank you for uh, giving me an opportunity to speak over to you parav thank you very much advocate bajpai i'd now like to move to dr mc gupta who is a doctor turned lawyer he is a practicing advocate with health and medical law as the area of special treatment i think at some stage we'd probably like to request the law makers to try and see the doctors and advocates in practice both professions together which is currently not allowed but that's a side note uh, dr mc gupta sir over to you sir you have 3 minutes to give your views sir okay thank you am i audible please okay yes dr gupta sir okay now since time is short i will straight away come to the topic and the topic is whether any changes in law are needed i have listed eight changes and i will come to them briefly one by one number one which is uh, engaging attention of doctors nowadays recently is about the fir now 
they say that FIR administered doctor should not be registered unless there is a compliance with the objective method judgment by getting an adverse report from an expert. But to me, the position is clear in view of the Lalita Kumari judgment, where the Supreme Court has clearly said that if there is a cognizable offense, then the police is bound to register FIR within seven days. Later, they increase the period to 14 days. And then they said that during these seven to 14 days, the investigating officer can undertake a preliminary investigation. The problem is that this preliminary investigation contemplated in Jalita Kumari is being confused by doctors as being the investigation suggested by the Jacob Matthew case. The preliminary investigation by the IO is only to the extent that if he is not sure whether it is a cognizable offense, then he can take time of the 14 days to decide. If he decides, if he determines it is a cognizable offense, he has got to register FIR. So I think there is a need to make it more clear by way of some amendment of law so that this confusion never does not prevail anymore. Second point. There about 20 states of India have got uh, laws against violence against doctors. The uh, real fact has been that very few cases are registered. Very few complaints are registered with the police under these laws. There is a need to bring out a central law for prevention of violence against doctors on the lines of the 20 state laws. And the Pradesh was the first one to bring that law. Third point is about the National Medical Commission Oblique Medical Council of India. Very surprisingly, the rules of the National Medical Commission, they say that if an, uh, if an adverse opinion or if the medical council has given a judgment, only the doctor can file an appeal. A patient party cannot file an appeal. Surprising, extremely surprising. They need to change that. Similarly, I have got on record with me an answer to the RTI. Here, MCI said they do not have any guidelines to ensure that the punishment given to a doctor is proportionate with the gravity of his offense. They need to come out with guidelines. Fourth point is very important. This is about the, the Clinical Establishment Act 2010. Those who have read this act, and section 12 of the act says, if a patient comes or is, or is brought to the emergency, to a clinical establishment, then he will be given emergency treatment till that time the patient is stabilized. And there is no mention about who will pay for it. A patient may come with burns, multiple stab injuries, whatever it is, he can walk in, into the hospital get to, and claim that I must get free treatment because the act does not speak a word about who will pay for it. Surprisingly, this is in spite of the fact that the Law Commission of India in its report in 2001 and 2006, report number 201, it has clearly stated that the government must come out with a law to ensure that while the treatment is given in emergency patients, it must be compensated. Doctors of hospital giving that thing, they must be compensated for the services. There seems to be an impression among the legislators, even judiciary, that doctors, they need to be giving charity by work. Supreme Court a few years ago 
in a judgment had passed directions when a patient female patient when a patient comes with burns injuries that's it feeling at that trauma to it of burn injuries then the doctor must provide reconstructive surgery oblique plastic surgery free doctor no even the layman know how much difficult and strenuous job it is to provide reconstructive surgery but they pass the judgments i do not blame the supreme court even for such judgments what are the i am been doing what is i am say been doing they keep fight they keep fight they don't protest anyway now the point about special tribunals for medical legal cases negligence cases yes that point is correct i agree with that something must be done in that regard then uh, it, it was mentioned also by one of these people there is a 1996 judgment by supreme court anirudh tilani versus bar council of maharashtra and goa in this judgment the supreme court has held that if a doctor or if somebody is having a professional degree like a doctor he will not be allowed to practice law if he has got, got a legal degree also he won't be allowed to practice law and join the bar council unless he gives up the previous profession the pt is that such a bar does not exist in any other common law country usa uk canada australia why here it was never pleaded this point was never pleaded i have been talking to the personally i have been talking to the residents and secretaries of ima as national dr gupta kindly take 20 seconds to wind up sir yeah, okay okay thank you and they agree but no one has now just one last point pndtf as per the pndt act if a complaint against a doctor is pending before the pndt authorities for violating the pndt act there is a provision that the registration of the doctor will be suspended for 5 years by the medical council even before any judgment comes so these are the eight points i wanted to mention regarding your changes are made thank you thank you dr gupta i am going to move on to justice ajay kumar mittal sir uh, justice ajay kumar mittal functioned as the active chief, acting chief justice of the high court of punjab and haryana he was also chief justice of the high court of meghalaya and then madhya pradesh he is on the board of governors of chitkara university honorable justice ajay kumar mittal sir may i request you to kindly render your views in the next 3 to 4 minutes sir a very good morning ladies and gentlemen but before thank i you. start I'll just like to point out hardly there is any time left. It's already eleven forty-five. So can I speak or something? Or the time is already over? No, sir. We have time, sir. We will probably skip the second round. But you have time. Please take your time, sir. Okay. Of course. First of all, I recommend the seventh medical convention on medicine and law that you have uh, <coughs> called this conference convention, which is commendable job. and since the time left is very little i will just like to go to the suggestions instead of pointing out let certain things well, law sector has already been discussed by various various <coughs> panelists earlier so one thing i will just like to say is that balance has to be evolved between the uh, rights of the patients and protection of doctors from frivolous and uh, unwarranted prosecution and <coughs> before proceeding under criminal action there should be reference to the medical council of india or or where there is in the it's a state case the medical board of state to examine consisting of two prominent doctors of the subject within time bound manner because since the, the law makers are also there so i would like to make this in a very short nutshell only then in case of government hospitals extra care is required for prosecution as at the time of employment or like engagement in the hospital the recruitment authorities verify all the credentials of the doctor so once that is done with unless the there is protection to the doctors also from unwarranted prosecution 
they will not be able to perform and give their best. Difference has to be drawn between professionally qualified doctor and a quack. Because normally the idea was the idea behind prosecution was that only those who do not have the proper degree they should be prosecuted. Not that a highly qualified doctor because what happens is on a number of occasions the chances of survival of a patient may be very minimal. But still uh, the medical procedure has to be performed on him. If a doctor is under the threat that there will be prosecution, then he may not be able to accept that uh, uh, operation and do his best. And as, as Dr. Yadav had said, and even uh, Mr. Vajpayee, uh, I also endorse that my view is that there should be, so far as IPC is concerned, it should not be left to general provisions of like 304A, 302, 337, 338, etc. There should be a specific provision like in gang rape cases, etc., a special provision has been made, uh, like 370 G2D, etc. So, the same way, there should be a specific provision for prosecution of doctors, so that at least they have safe, safety, as it, it was being pointed out, one of the speakers said, that in case of a doctor, there was 302 uh, case filed against him, and he committed suicide. So, that should not be there, that fear should not be there, in the mind of the doctors, while performing the operation. Similarly, like CRPC, there should be proper amendment there also. Before lodging, it should be properly scanned, whether it's a case for a lodging of FIR or not, or not. And more important is the Evidence Act, because it was being pointed out that Evidence Act has to be done. But there I would say, give a suggestion actually, a presumption should be raised, incorporated in favor of the qualified doctor, which may be rebuttable, that in case they are negligent, the patient can rebut it. Suppose a, a treatment was to be given and that was the only treatment which could have been given. But instead, a, a patient has been treated for B. Then in such a case, that presumption would not come in his way. But it should not, the presumption should not be conclusive. And, the, uh, and, it, and there should be, for so far as accountability of the uh, complainant and the officials should also be imposed wherever there is a frivolous litigation or um, uh, that file. Because otherwise, doctors and patients are not generally seen as adversaries. Uh, uh, and actually, doctors are seen as healers and savers. Uh, but with commercialization, this relationship is not retained. The age-old sanctity that is a matter of great concern to the medical profession. So, for that reason only, the this medical prosecution and under the Consumer Protection Act started for, coming uh, there. So, my submission to the even to suggestion to the lawmakers would be that IPC, CRPC, and the Evidence Act. Should be there. Should there is no requirement of any separate new act. Only thing is, it, these should be amended with separate uh, provisions for negligence of the doctors. And thank you end, very much. Yeah. At the end, I'll say thank you very much for inviting me. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Honorable Justice uh, Mittal, sir. I, I take this opportunity to move forward to the regulatory group. I'm, I'll come back to Justice Ravi Tripathi, sir. Um, I'd like, I believe Dr. Shiv Kumar Uttare has a prior engagement. Uh, Dr. Uttare, uh, he is the president of the Maharashtra Medical Council, the regulatory, the licensing authority for doctors in Maharashtra, and also a member of the National Medical Commission. Uh, Dr. Uttare is also a surgeon par excellence. Sir, your view, sir, on this current topic. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Parag. And at the outset, uh, I should thank IML and uh, <coughs> Mr. Ravindra for having invited me here today on this you know, important topic. And let me tell you, 10 years in the council, it is just recently that I'm finding more and more organizations talking about medical legal aspects. Otherwise, before this, we used to rarely talk about and I, th I think I should congratulate both the legal team and the medical team for taking this initiative. Now, today we are here to discuss basically about the criminality of the aspect of negligence. So I'm not going to go into all the ethical aspect and, you know, how we should communicate and all with the patients. So, I'll just, with your permission, do a little bit of uh, uh, screen sharing. Sure, sir. Yeah. So, basically, what we have to understand is, seeing in the sitting in the council for the last 10 years, let me tell you, interacting with thousands and thousands of doctors, uh, you know, all the doctors say they are basically mortally scared of only two things. One is being assaulted, beaten up by the, you know, patients or the relatives. And the second thing is when a criminal case is filed against these doctors and that has a very wrong uh, effect, a psychological effect on the doctors. And I've seen 
many are doctors who have left their practice just because of this problem having said that i'm not saying that uh, there should not be any uh, cases filed or you know, as far as negligence is concerned because statistics shows that a lot of uh, negligence is being taken place so but there has to be a balance that and this is what the judiciary has also done over the years between the patients and the doctors so i'm not going to go into the details of because a lot of the luminaries have already gone through this details but one thing i would like to point out is that there is a difference between negligence which is on the civil side and negligence which is on the criminal side which has been defined as gross negligence and this is one thing i think which people do not understand and especially you know when committees are formed in the medical colleges to decide on negligence their reports which i have seen just states that yes there has been negligence but is there gross negligence nobody opines on that because if there is gross negligence only then it should go as into the criminality of the uh, you know of the uh, negligence otherwise the rest of the negligence falls into the civil domain and this has been told even by the honorable judges in many uh, you know uh, many uh, judgments and even in if you see in section 304a the word gross has not been used at all uh, so again there is an ambiguity as far as what the court says and what has been written in section 300 and 304 uh, there is the jacob matthews case i'm not going to go into the uh, details katara case also everybody has spoken about that but what i would like to point out that even in the martin this is a case the judges have also said that if the police officers uh, you know arrest or harass harass a doctor without clear facts being uh, noted down as far as the jacob matthews case then these police themselves will face legal action and that is i think what should be done also in this case of uh, of the unfortunate dr archana sharma case which is there that you know they have to be taken to task as far as you know this judgment which is already there uh, uh, there over there but let me tell you just depending on the judgments is not going to help at all because many a times we find that there is a you know difference in interpretation of the judgment by the different courts and not only that but even the ipc just as it was pointed out that can an fir be filed half the people were saying that it cannot be filed unless it goes to uh, you know a committee whereas section 152 says that there is mandatory fir has to be filed if it is a cognizable offence offence so you know police file that fir taking you know recourse to this section now 154 and even if you see wrong diagnosis is not negligence but if you see there are two judgments one given by the supreme court which says that wrong diagnosis does not constitute medical negligence but there is a kerala high court judgment which says that wrong diagnosis is an act of negligence so you know this is the ambiguity is there when we are dependent only on uh, on you know these judgments which are there and therefore the requirement for having an amendment is definitely there as far as this criminal negligence is concerned now this is one thing which i would like to point out to all i think our soil members who are over here and even the medical fraternity that in 2021 as per whatever the jacob matthews case has said in that the judge had asked for the opinion uh, from the government and the mci at that time even the mci uh, as well mci had given their opinion but in 2021 from nmc we have given our opinion to the government i don't know what has happened after that if the government has, i think has given it to the supreme court but it, it has not yet come as far as on the floor of the house is concerned and what does what what does this say we have very very specifically given us the format of when an fir can be filed and when an arrest can be taken place where it clearly says that prior to making an arrest you for the complaint to a district medical council board which has to be formulated by the state governments as regards to the merit of allegation of criminal rashness or negligence contained in the complaint so it has to be primarily sent directly to the district medical board then this had the district medical board gets two weeks to come to some decision and give their opinion on that and if it is if uh, if uh, the recommendation by the district medical board is not acceptable by the investigating agency or by the doctors then they can refer it the matter to what is called as the state medical board for its recommendation which again should be given within two weeks so there is there is a two tier system it can go through where you know they the, you can the, you know the boards can tell you that if it is a medical negligence or not and this has to be appointed by the state government even who has to be appointed on the boards has been specified over there that there will be two specialists of the of the concerned branch 
on, on which the doctor you know who has treated that patient should be included in the board on the day of receipt of the complaint or the appeal now uh, what we also have said that that the state medical board shall provide reasons for endorsing or rejecting the recommendation of the district medical board and in case of an arrest of a registered medical practitioner in, in employment of the government or a central government their controlling officer should also be informed and if it is a private practitioner the state medical council is supposed to be informed so there is that that you know aspect is also there over there and unless the alleged negligence is negligence is of gross nature we have used the word gross over here and arrest is necessary for furthering the investigation or for collecting evidence or where the io feels that the doctor will be running away or whatever only then he can arrest otherwise the boards have to apply the bolam's test again this has been reiterated by the national medical commission also then we have also said that the permanent members on the board should change every 2 years it should not be a permanent uh, board which should be there and the permanent members of the board should be changed not only that but they should be the dghs or the civil surgeon officer should also be part of the of of this board <coughs> so these details have already been sent to the government from the national medical commission in 2021 and i hope the government goes ahead with uh, accepting these unfortunately over here we have not again defined what is gross negligence so my suggestion would be that yes supreme court has framed guidelines for seeing medical cases but we require to have amendments in the ipc itself so that it is followed by all you know the the investigation officers all over india not only that you know we need to be very clear and concise provision to define criminal medical negligence especially clarity on what constitutes gross negligence because nowhere have i seen i have gone through all the you know legal uh, judgments i have gone through all the ipc nowhere what is gross negligence has not been defined so what we require to do as a group is to define what is a gross negligence and then medical courts need to establish where the medical experts should be appointed to assist the judiciary and this is the concept of this medical tribunal which is being put forward by many members as comes forward and i i am sure that medical tribunal will go a long way in not only helping the medical uh, practitioners but also the patients to understand that justice is being done to them so thank you very much for uh, giving me this opportunity to uh, put forward my views as far as this criminality of uh, 304 is concerned thank you thank you very much dr tere uh, and i'd like to now invite uh, an extremely senior uh, uh, professional and extremely senior functionary the additional director general of the ministry of health and for family welfare dr jitendra prasad who has been associated uh, with a lot of the changes that we are seeing in the healthcare uh, scenario of the country uh, dr jitendra prasad sir over to you for your view sir uh, good morning sir good respected sir. chair honorable judges and distinguished participants first of all i would like to say that when a medical student after completion of his study gets the license to practice in the field of medicine he owes certain duties towards the services over the mankind and if there is something absence of reasonable care and skill or there is breach in the duty then the treatment of the patient that gives a patient to the right to initiate action against the medical negligence He does a doctor must exercise an ordinary degree of skill however they cannot guarantee of cure if he has adopted the right course of action he is skilled has worked with a method and manner best suited to the patient he cannot be blamed for the negligence even if the patient is not totally cured all death and negative outcomes of the diseases with good care cannot be considered as a negligence i am totally agree with the opinion of advocate mahendra bajpayee that uh and the uh, opinion of dr professor sri kumar that gross negligence word which has been used in the criminal negligence it has to be clearly defined what are the conditions in which gross negligence should be proved number 1 and uh, number 2 before prosecuting a doctor for criminal negligence 
a group of expert in the field of concerned specialty along with senior police officers of the rank of ips at least senior superintendent of police their permission and opinion should be taken before prosecuting a doctor and uh, losing an fir this is my opinion sir thank you thanks for your patience thank you very much uh, and i'd like to move to dr r k aneja who is the president of haryana medical council uh, dr aneja ravi ravindra is it there i don't think so sir okay and i had uh, kept my uh, favorite justice whom i have been listening to for the last 5 years justice ravi tripathi sir for the uh, for towards the end of this uh, and i'd like to now uh, give a total of 5 whole minutes sir with, with with whatever meager resources i have over to your honorable justice sir tripathi sir for your views on this topic you have been seeing changes over the last few decades and we'd love to know your views sir good afternoon to everybody our uh, friends it's very interesting to listen to the dignitaries of and luminaries of the field i am really thankful to the organizers for giving me this opportunity to be there i want to make two things clear first of all the general opinion which is coming forward is as if doctor should be given a very special treatment and a total immunity i don't think anybody can agree so far as total immunity is concerned and so far as special treatment is concerned i think nobody will disagree with that that they should be given a special treatment and that is what was mentioned by advocate mr mahendra bajpay also that doctors are a class by themselves and they are they deserve and they uh, do require a special treatment to be given friends so far as negligence is concerned a very high standard of due diligence is expected from the experts doctors and doctors by themselves is a class and a very special due diligence is expected from them and any lack of that you know there is a general impression in the mind of the people that they are powerful people they are influential people and that therefore they are beyond the reach of the common man the basic problem is that we have seen a super commercialization of the medical uh, care uh, sector and that has created all these problems one of the speaker very rightly said that there is lack of trust and lack of uh, faith in the uh, doctors then these all problems start the another panelist very rightly said that if you take percentage wise you will find that these instances are not even forming a part um, in 0.1% of the total uh, service uh, medical service uh, which is taking place in the country friends so far as a special treatment is concerned i really wonder why mci did not move the honorable the supreme court again after the 2005 judgment was given in fact i must congratulate and uh, uh, that will be right thing because if you remember the about the sexual harassment at the workplace that uh, visakra's judgment is very famous and very important because supreme court legislated the guidelines and made the provision that unless the competent legislative body annex the law on that particular subject these guidelines will continue to prevail as a law same is the case here with the jacob and in the case, jacob matthews case also the supreme court said the same thing that the legislative should legislate on this and should provide the guidelines now 17 long years we did not move the honorable the supreme court saying that sir please remind the legislative body for doing this of course they they might have accepted they might not have accepted because they had already said that until they legislate these guidelines will continue now so far as lack of observance of guidelines provided by the supreme court by the police personnel is not something which is within the control of the supreme court or even the high court or even the subordinate courts until that particular instance is brought to their notice by the concerned person and so one thing is very simple and there is a judgment of the honorable the supreme court and observations in other cases also that if the wife is over sensitive and she commits suicide on account of something which she felt very bad about the behavior of the husband or the uh, husband's uh, relatives the husband is not held responsible for that that he uh, abetted the suicide of that particular wife now same is the case here that if a particular doctor has committed suicide i am not justifying that that suicide was uh, i mean uh, 
uh, is done and it is to be neglected no but at the same time if the doctors behave in a very over sensitive manner possibly nobody can help them and one thing is certain i have been repeatedly telling as you are rightly referring that i have been uh, associating myself with this discussions for quite long judiciary does have and i repeat judiciary does have a respect for the doctors as a class there is no personal grievance or to any judge against any particular doctor but then the difficulty is sir uh, we are also human beings we are living in a society we have vast relations and those relations do come to us and tell us that such a such way we were treated in the particular hospital and this happens not because the personal doctor is uh, you know having a particular temperament but this is because of the staff which is there in the hospital which gives sometime a very bad treatment to the relations and even the patient when they are in the uh, hospital for taking the treatment so friends one thing is certain that we do require jacob matthew to be now put in a statutory frame and beside that there should be special provisions for that so for example so far as rape cases are concerned bribe burning cases are concerned the court has already provided and then the statute has already provided that they will be investigated by a officer of a particular rank and not not below that particular rank similar uh, procedure i mean provision can be made for the doctor, doctors also and if you remember in the jockey um, matthews case also the supreme court said that the arrest will be avoidable now let us understand very uh, clearly two things filing of an fir there are judgments of the supreme court that they say that police person cannot refuse to accept the fir in logic but then the arrest is secondary thing and in so far as second, uh, arrest is concerned there are again guidelines of the supreme court that arrest should be made only in the cases where there are three things that particular person is going to upset the investigation he is going to upset the collection of the evidence or that he is not going to be available for the prosecution at a later stage only in those cases the arrest is required in fact these are the principles which also govern the field of whether bail or jail so friends i wholeheartedly agree that doctors do need a special treatment and a special protection because they cannot be left to the people uh, being attacked by the people because ultimately it is going to be against the society as a whole so my friends i am really happy that i am given this opportunity to participate in the debate i was really uh, enlightened by the views heard by i wholeheartedly agree with the views expressed by dr nagral and also uh, mr mahendra bajpay the learned advocate thank you very much thank you very much sir i am going to now request i i would uh, i would now request advocate r uh, shanmuga sundaram uh, who is the advocate general of tamil nadu state to kindly uh, render his views on this topic in in maybe a couple of minutes sir uh, dr parah he is unable to join he okay just called me so okay fine and i think uh, extremely important to go back to the voice of the uh, the end recipient of all our services may i request uh, dr ratna devi who is the ceo of dakshini and amravati health and education and also past chair of the international alliance of patient organization i request you again to kindly come on and kindly uh, give your views madam on this topic in the next couple of minutes please I think we have to move on, uh, Dr. Parag. Yeah, I was. I think we had just located her, and yeah, she is logged in. Okay. So I'd like to open the floor for maybe uh, maybe thirty thirty seconds each, in case any any one of you would like to uh, like to render your views. And I'm going to start uh, before I move over and hand over to Advocate Mayank Shir Sagar, who is the convener. I'd just like to quickly uh, go through the panelists and see whether there is. Uh, maybe we'll start with the doctors. Uh, and at first like to actually give the floor to uh, for a minute to dr sunita padhyay you've heard uh, views counter views uh, points of views uh, relating to sensitivity reactions related to how people respond and multiple other things uh, how the society should react dr sunit uh, your views quickly in a minute if you could just quickly give us your rebuttal on any of these points sir dr padhyay any of the other doctors uh, dr gurbir sir dr jayakrishnan dr mukherjee no i want to move yes sir so just 30 seconds this is a quick rapid fire round sir 
Are you saying to me? Yes, sir. Please, Dr. Gupta. Okay. Please go ahead. 30 okay. seconds. I want to make only one point. Yes, sir. That as per the very moderate calculations done by me, there are about 17,000 doctors, MBBS doctors in India with an LB degree. They are all debarred from practicing as advocates because the Bar Council refused to register them in view of the Supreme Court judgment. Who is suffering from it, from this judgment? The courts find it very difficult to adjudicate in medical legal matters because they don't have advice. The public suffers because there is no one to argue for them. Everybody suffers and I think it is high time that this judgment is reviewed. I have talked to President and Secretary of IMA. Everybody agrees, but someone has to find a mechanism to get the judgment reviewed. Your point is noted, Dr. Gupta. Uh, any other quick suggestions, 15, 20 seconds uh, from the doctor's team? Uh, Dr. Nagra, I count you in both the teams, sir. Oh, okay. Thank you. Uh, but I need to, uh, can I make a quick comment? Yes, sir. Okay, great, Parag. So, two comments, if you allow. Number one, we heard today that uh, there is a need for state medical boards, etc. But let me just remind everybody that there's something called the Clinical Establishments Act in this country. And that envisaged the setting up of boards. And I was a member of the state government committee in Maharashtra, which attempted to actually have district level boards consisting, but the difference was we gave a suggestion that it should have civil society representation, patient representation and doctor representation. That was opposed tooth and nail by the IMA. If Dr. Uh, Dr. Uttare is here, he can respond. It was opposed tooth and nail. So the point number one. Point number two, and I want the judges here to respond. To the, there is something called conflict of interest. Doctors sitting in judgment over fellow doctors uh, is, is never going to be looked at as a good process. So we need to open out all these... Uh, all these institutions which are looking at perceived negligence to non-doctors. And that is a principle, I think, that is followed all over the world. But here we seem to be very closed and that makes it even more opaque. Thank you. Sure. Thank you, Dr. Nagrat. Uh, from the doctor's team, I don't seem to have any further opinions. Uh, or Just one, one point. Yes, Dr. Jai Krishna, 30 seconds. Yeah. The thing is that uh, first thing we should require special law. Till uh, the, uh, a new law is formulated, uh, the medical council, like the uh, government servants for RS, it requires permission from the uh, government. Similarly, they, uh, there should be some uh, mechanism to inform or take permission from the medical council before arrest of a doctor. That is one thing. And second thing is how this uh, gross negligence and uh, negligence is classified, the medical council should, uh, the National Medical Commission should come out with a, a detailed document on that. That is my suggestion. Okay. Uh, 30 seconds to uh, uh, Honorable Justice Ajay Kumar Mittal. Uh, sir, anything of your end that you'd like to add in light of what we've discussed? And subsequently, Honorable Justice Ravi Tripathi ji. Honorable Justice Mittal, Parag, if you could give me a chance to... Yes, I will come back to you, sir, in a minute, sir. I can't be accused of uh, favoritism, you know. <laughs> uh, Honorable Justice Tripathi ji, sir, over to you, sir. Right. Uh, Dr. Nag uh, Nagral was talking a very, uh, you know, relative, uh, re I mean, most uh, related uh, topic. Uh, so far as uh, Bar Council of India is concerned, as a Law Commission member of, Law Commission of India member, we had an opportunity to recommend our uh, amendments to the Advocates Act. And that we had said that Bar Council of India is also required to be, uh, you know, reconstituted on the lines of the Bar Council they are having in the United Kingdom. Because uh, he was rightly saying that when a doctor is, as, um, I mean, judging or judging the case of another brother doctor, they are always accused of uh, not uh, the fair uh, treatment. Same is the case with the Bar Council of India also. All bar, I mean, advocates cases about the malpractices go to the Bar Council of India and they are decided by them, which is not considered to be a, a homogeneous uh, body. Right. Right. No, I think that's fine. We have members of parliament uh, deciding things about members of parliament, police officers for police officers. I think it is uh, it is that's the way the cookie is going to crumble in our country. sir. Uh, with that, uh, over to advocate Bajpai for his 30 second uh, rapid comments, please, sir. 
uh, uh, not a commentary parag but just two clarifications yes what this tripathi has already given uh, a recommendation has been made that uh, uh, at least the bar council of india should have uh, uh, other professionals also but let us uh, understand one thing and this is very specifically when i uh, 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 respond to what uh, dr nagral has said professional body is uh, pertaining to any profession they will always have the professionals of that very uh, group so you take the professional body of chartered accountant uh, you take the professional body of company secretaries of architects they are going to have architects and please understand these professional bodies will have to look into the negligent conduct okay as a profession you understand what are the do's and don't ifs and buts of that profession Uh, you are expected to uh, uh, give justice or decide cases transparently but the charge of professional prejudices the charge of conflict of interest will always be there and it's unavoidable para trust me absolutely sir it absolutely can't be a chartered accountant deciding how an advocate works At we no point noted sir questions of what we are facing similarly you face it uh, 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 dr utture had uh, in fact raised one uh, uh, aspect that negligence and gross negligence should be uh, 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 defined described very specifically it can't be done world over you don't have a medical negligence act it can't be there negligence is simply uh, no diligence carelessness a higher degree of carelessness uh that's all parag that i want to add thank you advocate bajpai and uh, the last uh, 30 seconds before i hand over to my esteemed colleague advocate mayank shri sagar to dr ravi shankar sir i just want to quickly add on three practical points clinical establishment act in this country is not uniformly formed in the country every state has got a different one state says you need to keep the case sheets for 10 years one state says 8 years the disparity in the clinical establishment act all over the country cannot be made to be standard for the medical professional one number two communication and transparency is the acquisition of the patients only when things when they are not satisfied when things go the other way and they when they are asked to pay the bill this is communication and transparency if there is not that hospital or the doctor he has got all right to shift himself away from the hospital to the place where he is comfortable that is what dr kulsha did from going from amre to bridge candy why don't people follow that if they are not satisfied they should go out of the hospital take their own decision they should be accused at the time when they are not satisfied or when they think they are asked to pay the bill last all these things will happen they don't pay the bills to the hospital get away what is there in the law for us to recover the money which we have spent on at least on the infrastructure leave alone the professional on the infrastructure thank you for the opportunity thank you dr ravi shankar uh, pashtam buddhi brush as they say in sanskrit it's always nice to reflect in hindsight uh, with that i'm going to uh, conclude my role and render a vote of thanks to all my esteemed participants and hand over to convener uh, advocate mayank shri sagar uh, advocate mayank shri sagar sir over to you sir and then subsequently over to dr vet prakash sir uh, thank you dr ridani uh, it was a very detailed and a very informed discussion and we all are very delightful to have all sort of inputs and i would just sum up in five ten lines as to what is the outcome or what basic points that were highlighted in this uh, session um, basically there has to be a balance between the life of patients and protection of doctors from these unwarranted proceedings uh, as we see there is a large voice that has been echoing in this discussion as regard establishment of a medical there are special tribunal for medical negligence cases which will also encompass not only the criminal cases but also the civil cases there is also a dire need to cap the the compensation that has been awarded and the circumstances and guidelines as regards award of uh, award of compensation in the medical negligence cases <clears throat> apart from that there is a need to define gross negligence that has been echoing in lot uh, in lot many suggestions that have come forward today apart from all these aspects 
the reanalysis of provisions that are already existing in the ipc are also required to be recommended as to how those provisions have to be interpreted and not only this we also have to counterbalance what uh, protection is required and what safeguards are to be given while making our suggestions as regards the amendment that we are proposing and as regards the jacob matthews judgment and what more needs to be done apart from jacob matthews and various other judgments that have been discussed today another need that i feel that has arisen out of the discussion is as regards educating the police officers not only the higher rank officers like an sp is the dsps or the ios but also to the lowest of the levels in the police force because they are the persons who are the first responders probably another suggestion that has very well come forward is instead of a board the matter should be referred to medical council with the case papers and then have an opinion and then proceed further if there is a need for for a criminal prosecution i believe that these are the very good suggestions and definitely we'll be able to make our suggestions in the white paper and would def- and considering that today's government is taking suggestion hearing people as regards the various obsolete laws are there a special mention and a special protection for doctors in the ipc crpc and the relevant evidence act part will be able to suggest a few changes and also insertion of few provisions which will help to further our cause for which we all have assembled today i thank everybody that has been a part of this discussion and also we are very delighted to have all the views that we have received today and with this i would like to conclude and hand over to uh, to mr mangal who can take over from here the session and lead it to its logical conclusion uh i think uh, advocate sagar i'll be closing the thing i request uh, dr professor vet prakash mishra to kindly give his closing remarks please sir uh, over to you sir thank you very much uh, well learned participants you would agree with me that two and a half hours down the line it has absolutely been a very enriching and enlivening experience were very diligent suggestions critical appraisals realistic assessment of the prevailing situation and scenario and the way forward has been diligently crystallized a civil society is expected to be plagued by prudence where anarchy cannot have a place in its any form when socrates contemplated this then in that situation an intricate balance between the rights of anybody and everybody turns out to be a judicious approach which is the hallmark of a civil prudent society maintaining the pace and maintaining the text of this civility the four poses which were articulated by advocate bashpai and the answers to those four poses i think have been diligently evolved in this entire discussion brought out by the learned luminaries with different shades hues colors and perceptions the core connotation is absolutely centralizable this is not a phenomena just which is limited to this country ladies and gentlemen i am reading out a paper where the phenomena is almost global in nature and character and therefore it is imperative when the honorable supreme court contemplated guidelines in the jacob matthews case they cannot be taken to be cosmetic they just cannot to be taken on their face value they need diligent implementation they are purposive they are relevant they are absolutely need based and ultimately they are aimed at achieving certain set of goals and targets it is in that context my trust and belief when i am wanting to put across as closing remarks it's a issue which needs to be dealt by efficacious effective legislation state enactment 17 states have already put across 
prohibition of violence against doctors let me put it across very candidly in continuation with the statistical dimensions which have been very aptly put across by dr uh, dr mukesh yadav none of these acts in these 17 states have proved to be effective in any manner whatsoever a critical appraisal of that has already been worked out and it is in that count it is mandated that a central act seems to be inevitably necessary that central act contemplates important dimensions which in my understanding have been invoked in this discussion is incorporation of jacob matthews guidelines in the form of law both in words and explicit law preferably not only in crpc but corresponding changes in all cogent and relevant laws including crpc and in indian evidence act this seems to be the first necessity which is needed in the in, in this entire context this does not mean and should not mean any prejudice of any form to any of the charters of patients and their rights in any manner that balance is inevitable and that cannot be sidelined under any circumstances but this is something which is mandated in the in the present situation and scenario alternatively medical tribunal that itself by itself can turn out to be a very efficacious modality which could also be a beautiful alternative that can be thought of ladies and gentlemen in this short span of time the way the learned eminent people from different walks of life have put across their candid opinion i from the chair i have only humble salutations for the same i take them all as relevant i take them all as absolutely timely i take them all of them made, made all of them having been made with absolute degree of sincerity thoughtful thoughtfulness and critical appraisal i record my endorsement to the same the cumulative depiction which has been brought out is equally effective and i am sure that a white paper on these considerations can be taken up and can could be brought up incorporating these these various cues and suggestions which have been made crystallizing them into operable guidelines i had the fortune of being the chairman of the committee which articulated the report on jacob matthews guidelines being incorporated in law way back in 2018 on behalf of the medical council of india which had been reiterated by national medical commission in the form of the amendments which are required to be the required to be made including the nature and wording of the amendment having been worked out in terms of the justification the document and the report i have already forwarded to uh, uh, ravindra uh, for his information therefore what i am wanting to put across the, the, the entire deliberation that have taken place let that be toned down and crystallized down for the purpose of invocation of a white paper which should serve as a good referral document for the policy makers to be for incorporating an aid incorporating a change which is needed lest really we turn out to be a real, genuine civil society interested in balancing each other's right away from the anarchy working out in a disciplined manner in the domain of prudence absolute prudence and total prudence thank you very much thank you very much uh, dr professor ved prakash mishra ji and i'd like to now hand over uh, for for a vote of thanks to the chief operating officer of institute of medicine and law uh, mr agasti mathri agasti over to you agasti you are on mute sir am i yeah audible yeah thank you dr parag okay uh, thank you all the distinguished panelists all the luminaries the dignitaries and the honorable judges for joining us today on this very interactive session uh, we have been fortunate enough to bless uh, to all the i mean all the luminaries who have uh, graced us for all our ncml for today i like to thank dr vp mishra for chairing this uh, or to for sharing this convention i like to thank i like to thank dr advocate mayank Sh mayank shersagar for being a convener to us i like to thank dr parak for moderating this session with this mixed bag of panelists thank you dr parak once again again i like to thank my team for putting up this very knowledgeable informative uh, 
informative convention and thank you all the updates regarding our national convention on medicine and law will be available on medicineandlawconvention.com we will follow up soon those who have registered will get a copy of the report very soon thank you so much have a great sunday bye